drive a Toyota Prado. Yeah, it's not impressive. It's fairly old now. It's my second one. I always wanted to own a four-wheel drive, and I need to. I tow a boat that needs something like that to do it. I remember when I first got my first Toyota Prado. Beautiful silver Toyota Prado. So proud of it. I, I, all of a sudden, as I was driving it, began to notice something. Everybody was driving a Toyota Prado. It was crazy. Wherever I looked, there, there was one, another one, another one, another one. It dawned on me that when you're in something, you notice it everywhere. Right now, I'm in something. Right now, our church is in something, and wherever I go, I see it. I saw it at the youth camp last weekend. Hundreds of kids worshipping Jesus, many of them finding him as Lord and Savior, many of them being baptized in the Holy Spirit. A conversation that we had at our life group just a handful of days ago. We, we began to discussing things regarding this very teaching theme and, and all of a sudden what, what our, our conversation went to was the, the very issue that I just literally see everywhere. Lynn and I said the other day, Let, let's, let's head, head off to the movie. Somebody gave us a, a couple of tickets to go and see the movie The Forge. If you can go and see it, if it's still on, go and see it. It literally captures again the same thing that I'm seeing over and over and over again. In the, the, uh, the youth hall to the back yesterday, we had a birthday party for Lynn's mother that turned 100 this week. Lynn's mum turned 100. It's pretty amazing. Her dad made it to 99 and a half. Lynn's mum's 100. Lynn's going to live to 145. I don't know why, but she just keeps asking me, have I paid all the bills? And I saw yesterday, even of our own family, in one room, four generations. I'm seeing it everywhere. And my heart simply says, okay, God, you have my attention. The theme in my heart transcends just a teaching series that we're ministering here at Hope Center. I want to say a huge hello to everybody that's watching this online. I'm so glad to everybody that's in the parents' room. Lean in. This is a word of the Lord for all of us in this season. See, God has a plan for the planet. We, we find it even in the essence of his name. Several times in Scripture, our Heavenly Father is introduced to us as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of generations. Say generations. He's the God of generations. And in fact, in Psalm 145, his plan for humanity is found in what he wants to do in and through generations. Psalm 145 verse 4 says, one what? Generation commends your works to another, they tell of your mighty acts. One generation will commend your works to another. A mother to a daughter, a son, a father to a daughter, to a son, to grandchildren. One generation will commend your works to another and tell of your mighty acts. That's always been God's plan. I have a simple thought around this whole dimension of the advancement of the kingdom of God. I believe the kingdom of God advances supernaturally, yes. But it advances primarily on, along the lines of meaningful relationships and empowered generations. It's always been God's plan that one generation to the next would declare and demonstrate the wonder of God in a human life. It's always been the way, but as you read through Scripture, and perhaps even as you follow church history and human history, you will quickly discover that it's not always been a fact that people play their part in this process. In the Old Testament, I find one of the most disturbing texts in the whole Scripture. It's what motivated me for 20 years 
to stay in youth ministry. I was in my 40s and still active in youth ministry because this verse literally gripped my heart. Judges 2 verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, that is a polite term for saying after they died, another generation, say those two words with me, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he'd done for Israel. Pause. Wasn't God's plan that one generation would commend his works to another? And yet the Bible says in the book of Judges chapter two, there came another generation that did not know what God had done, who God was. And the tragedy of it, in fact, the mind-blowing fact around this verse is the generation that they're speaking of followed a generation that I've preached about, a generation that many celebrate, Generation that saw God do incredible things. We call them the Joshua generation. We've talked about it. We've preached from this platform many times upon Joshua. God did incredible things. It was a remarkable era. In the Joshua generation, they saw the sun stand still for 24 hours. The Joshua generation saw the Jordan River depart and separate naturally, supernaturally. The Joshua generation saw the Jericho walls come down and on and on and on. The Joshua generation, literally in our language, the Joshua generation saw a revival. But there arose another generation. The one straight after a revival generation. Oh, I hope I grab your heart today. A generation that saw God do phenomenal things, enjoyed his miracles, enjoyed his power, and yet they, they took cities and lost their kids. Many times I've said, I want to be part of a Joshua generation. After I read Judges 2.10, I said, no, I don't. Because I live with this conviction that we, the church, live potentially one day away from revival and one generation away from extinction. God help us take seriously our responsibility with generational impartation. They didn't pay attention to the commands and the God-given responsibilities that they were given before they entered the promised land. They were clearly told what to do. I'm going to put on the screen Deuteronomy chapter 6. Listen to it. This is before the Joshua generation entered into the fullness of the promise. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Here's the command, love the Lord your God, read it with me, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the commandment. He says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. I've underlined verse 7. Impress them on your children. Impress them. Where? On your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, make it natural. Make it continual. Make it a lifestyle of generational impartation of the word of God and the grace of God and his goodness. It says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. As Deuteronomy 6 unfolds, these instructions continue. The Lord tells his people that when you enter your blessed inheritance, Joshua generation, There are two big words in Deuteronomy 6. Don't forget. Don't forget what I've done for you and keep imparting them to the generations that follow. We have a God who does amazing things. Can somebody say amen? He heals, he saves, he sets free, he provides. He is awesome. He's a miracle working God and he wants us to live in his blessing and favour daily. But we have been blessed 
to be a blessing. We have received to give. We have revelation for impartation. Generation by generation. And their forgetfulness had consequences. The generation that followed all of these incredible miracles that stepped into a promise they'd been holding on to for hundreds of years. They stepped into that promise. Things they'd been praying for, the things they'd been believing for, they stepped into it, but they lost their kids. The very next generation. Next thing you know, the generation that followed Joshua are worshipping foreign gods. They're setting their own rules. Wonder if this sounds familiar. Lawlessness, lawlessness and corruption pervaded all of society. Does that sound familiar? Got a better question. Have you watched the news lately? And they lost the favor and protection of God. Many tragedies unfolded. I have a sense that we are standing in a very significant and prophetic moment in the church in this nation. The tough seasons we've been through, I feel like God is at work. I travel extensively to different parts of this nation. I was in another state just this week ministering to pastors and just see the blessing of God and the favor of God and the power of God at work. And, and there's people entering into something that's very, very, very special and my prayer is, God, do again, do more, do more, do more. But God, help us not just park in this moment and forget our responsibilities to bring the next generation with us. Parents, if you're home online right now, listen. If you're in the parents' room right now, listen. Pray with your children. Teach them the Bible. Live out your faith daily. Keep them planted in the church. Never criticize the church. Never criticize the church. Church isn't perfect. You're in it. So, so, so just... But celebrate the goodness of God. The greatness of God. Bible tells me in Psalm 92, those that are planted will flourish in life. Even when they're old, they'll still be bearing fruit. Get your kids planted in there. Don't make church attendance optional. Well, if there's no fun run and the weather's not great and this isn't happening, and we're having a, then we'll go to church. No, no, no. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I was glad when they said, let's go. Let, let's go and let's even be early. Let's show this is a priority in our family. Come on. Serve together. One of the things I love watching in this church, and I'm seeing more and more of it happen, is whole families serving Jesus, generations. Whether they're in children's ministry or car park or youth or wherever, just generationally serving. There's something wonderful about just walking together, serving the Lord with gladness. It's so, so important. A few weeks ago, we had our national director of our children's ministry, Andy Kirk preaching from this platform. His message is on our website. It is a very, very important message for parents. If you haven't yet seen it, or even if you have, maybe it's worth just going back, watching it on public transport as you head to work or as you drive somewhere or watch it, just let, let it get into your spirit. Because I don't want to be one of those Christians who lives out of full faith and then because of my neglect, of my neglect, our kids aren't following Jesus. You can't guarantee they're going to follow the Lord. You can't guarantee. God has no grandchildren. I just don't want to be responsible for why they're not. Did you hear that? And watching these beautiful people getting baptized, many of whom were young today, it just made my heart glad. I was thrilled to see what God is doing in our ministries. Parents, if you've got children in youth and children's ministry, I can I tell you, you've got good people that have given up their time. Almost all of them are volunteers. And they're people that are being trained. They're people that we've edited and audited. 
make sure that, you know, they're, they're, they're going to look after your children, but they're partnering with you to raise champions in another generation. Bless them, thank them, pray for the people working with your children. But beyond this house, it's chaotic. Beyond life in a local church, what we think is normal, blessing, peace, favor, love, joy, what we think is normal is foreign to so many people. Just foreign. Family breakdown is everywhere. Dysfunction, some of you just saw that story. And but for Jesus, what would that family have been like today? He changes. He doesn't only change hearts, he change ho- changes homes. That's what our God does. And, and my, my burden, and in my roles even beyond this house, of somehow influencing the church in our nation. My prayer is thank God for what's happening with what we're doing with children that are already part of the church because of their their parents and their partnership here. My, My prayer is God continue to do a work in them. But God, there's thousands, there's millions outside this house that haven't yet met Jesus. God, help us reach them. God, help us reach them. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Ryan and I were up at Morton. I didn't know it, but there was a special function happened right in the, in the foyer there. There was a, a, every day that week, a different cohort of the groups that we're working with in Mimi's house were coming through and our team had, had serving them a, a chef, a quality chef, was given those beautiful kids whose lives were chaotic outside of what we're doing with them. They were serving them a three-course meal, sit down in a, in quotes, restaurant setting. Beautiful setting, china plates, proper cutlery. They're sitting at tables. It was just magnificent, absolutely magnificent. And I was going around talking to some of the kids and I said to one little girl, is this tasty? She said, it's more than tasty. I was starving because I didn't have breakfast again today. We had it at one of our Camp Colossal days, a a, a young child who was just struggling a little bit and I found out why. Not, listen, it's not their fault. It's where they're from. Parents were in strife, strife for the law, strife with addictions. One of those children, in fact, all five of the kids from that family had shared a half a tub of ice cream that morning for breakfast. We have to help them. We have to reach them with the love of God. And there's not just that sector of society that people just need the Lord. Could somebody say amen? We need to get the message of, of what God can do in a life. The, the fact is, some of these people that we're talking about today in, in, in difficult circumstances, I talk to people that are working in that sector. The system is saturated. The, the officials just are, are actually at a level where they just don't know even what to do. They're not coping anymore. Such is the brokenness in society. My, my only antidote for that is what Jesus said he'd come to do. Give us an anointing that binds up brokenness, that sets captives free. So I don't ever want to be part of a church that's just all about how good Sunday is. I love Sundays. We should get here as often as we can. Large groups, small groups, it's important. It's a biblical pattern for a follower of Jesus. But thank God for it. Worship that's amazing. Ministry that inspires. But oh God, help us realize there's so much more beyond the four walls of this building. That's why I'm happy to partner with any ministry that says, you know what? We'll work with the local church to help people find Jesus. People need the Lord. So what is our biblical response and responsibility to this message? In a word, discipleship. Discipleship. And what we want to address today is not only that we have to do it, but how we possibly could. I... I'm released from this house and travel a lot. If I'm not here, I'm usually doing a conference for leaders or a conference or an event for men. 
since I wrote the book last year, it's uh, just literally opened up so many more doors and, and I'm getting to speak to a lot of people, men in particular, young men, older men, and it's becoming more and more apparent to me that there is a massive father wound in our nation. A massive father wound that can't be fixed by anyone or anything except the revelation of the father heart of God. Just last month I was at an event and it was, a, it was an unusual kind of setting for me. It was a large event. Everybody at the event had got a copy of my book as part of their registration. And uh, they said, after each session, we're actually going to have groups break out into groups of about 20 all across this thing as a large gathering. And that what they're going to do is they're going to discuss what they just heard and how they're going to apply it to their life. Would you like to be part of that? I thought, like, okay. I thought, I'm going to go and listen to what people heard me preach. That was interesting. And I sat with a young guy. Let's just call him John. John was there with an ankle bracelet on. Because he's about to go to court and he's probably facing a long-term jail prison. Drug-related issues. He was there with people supervising him. He was there because someone sponsored him. And and he was there on a, a, a break with permission and supervision from a drug rehab center that he was currently part of. And I said to him, tell me your story. It's the story we've just been talking about. It's a story of a young man that had a very, very poor relationship with his mother and father and dad was gone when he was fairly young. And as he told me his story, you could just see life and just his history, even up until his mid-20s already, just written all over his life and body. And as I looked at this young man, he was obviously intelligent. He was obviously talented. But his life was now a mess. Just become a young dad. And he said, the reality is, Mike, I may not actually get to raise my child until they're in their mid-teens. Because he'll be in jail. And as I listened to this young man, I, I just thought, how would your life be different if you'd had a decent home? If you'd had a mum and or a dad that would have just loved you, how would your life have been different if you'd met Jesus 10, 15 years ago? How would your life have been different if someone from a local church had just loved you and brought you in and taken you on a discipleship journey? How would it have been different? The answer is it completely different. The Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 5 and 6, Speaking of our God, he is a father to the fatherless. A defender of the widows is our God. He's holy dwelling. Listen to what verse 6 says. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is what he does. He sets the lonely in families. Some versions say solo. Individuals. In families, he leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. God puts the lonely... In families. Can I tell you, in this era of human history, on top of the nuclear family, there is the church family. And God takes the lonely, takes the isolated, one version says. Takes the person that didn't have the pleasure of what many of us have had. A beautiful home with caring parents didn't have that. And he takes them and says, I'll show you what love is. I'll show you how to impart generationally. I'll show you how to walk out a life that honors Jesus. I'm going to put you in a local church and see your life come right. See the journey unfold. You see, when we gather like this, when we gather in life groups, we come to worship God. We come to be inspired through the teaching of the word. But there's so much more that we come to do. We come for fellowship. We come for true community. 
That's why we encourage you to, to don't just come as the first song's being sung and, and, and leave as the last one's being sung. No, come and, come and engage. Come and, and be involved. Come and, and be part of community. Find yourself in a life group. Make some friends. And, and as we do, you, you start to discover what the Bible says. We're iron, can sharpen iron, and we can go and we can grow. We can learn and we can live out our faith. It's what it's meant to be. Can someone say amen? It's how it's meant to be. Learning and loving and growing together. The Apostle Paul put it this way. 1 Corinthians 4. It says, though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ. Some words in other versions say 10,000 teachers. Yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, I love this, imitate me. There's a lot of people who will teach you something, but not everybody can be a father to you. Teachers give lessons, fathers give their lives. Teachers talk, fathers listen. Teachers have information fathers have influence the beauty with the apostle paul is it wasn't just theory he he outworked it over and over and over again one classic illustration in the bible is what he did for timothy we don't know a whole lot about timothy's dad except that he he was a greek so he grew up in a, a mixed race family which in those days especially had some challenges a greek dad and a jewish mom we don't think that Timothy's father was a follower of Jesus. He, certainly he wasn't uh, anyone of note in the life of the local church and probably even most of his life he wasn't a, a Christian. And it seems very apparent from studying scripture that Timothy's dad died when he was quite young. And so into the life of this young man that had voids steps a mature man, steps a mature follower of Jesus, a man of God. And when you read the letters that Paul writes to Timothy, when you read the letters that Paul writes to the churches of the, of the emerging church, he, he over and over and over, there's references to how he's helping and leading and guiding and role modeling Timothy. And be before you know it, he's raised up this young leader to ultimately become the pastor of the largest church on the planet in that time. Didn't just happen. He celebrates the fact that he had a godly mom and a godly grandmother and they did incredible things to him. But, but there came into his life somebody that said, you know what, get him into this community and I'll play my part. He might have 10,000 teachers, but he needs someone who will fill the role of a spiritual dad. Before you turn me off, girls, it's not just a male thing. Over and over the Bible talks to mature age women to impart to younger women. We need the mothers. I, I, I was reading just, just this week about Deborah, a mother of Israel. I, you know, I used to hear those terms, a mother of Israel. You know, I used to think some, some old granny knitting. No, no, no. Mother of Israel, they're warriors. They're mighty. They're mighty. We need some mighty women to look out for the young women coming through this house. We look out for the young women that God is still yet to bring them into his kingdom. I look in, in the Old Testament and I see Naomi and Ruth. Another example of, of, of somebody reaching beyond just their own little space and imparting and bringing somebody on a journey. Naomi lost her husband. She knew what it was to navigate grief and then her daughter-in-law loses her husband. And Naomi comes beside her and says, let me guide you into a better future than what you could have in a culture like that where being a widow was not an easy thing. father to the fatherless, a mother to the motherless, a families, communities where we can all grow together. Whether you're watching the news, you're walking through the street, you're looking around, you're involved in ministry, it becomes very apparent that there's a lot of young people that have never had a great relationship with their mother and father. And the church has a role to play. That's my appeal to all of us today. 
My appeal primarily is to those of us that are mature age. What's mature age? Pick your own number. We've all got an opportunity to impart to other generations. Because there's people out there that need someone to listen to their dreams. Just listen. One of my mottos in life is to be heard is so close to being loved, most people can't tell the difference. Let's be better listeners. Show them how to live. Show them how to live. Paul said, you know, let me tell you what a father does. He shows you how to live. He says, imitate me. He repeats that theme in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, my team hear me repeat this regularly every year. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I'm doing my best to be a follower of Jesus. So if you, if you can't quite work out how to follow him, follow me and I'll take you to him. We need people who will demonstrate what it's like to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul and your strength. How to live without compromise. Follow Jesus well, we say here. And impart wisdom. Impart wisdom. Show biblical principles for the challenges people are facing in life. And can I just before you say, oh, I don't know any broken people. We've all got stuff. And we can all do with a little bit of extra help. I grew up with a godly mum and dad. They lived out their faith. I saw God do incredible things for them. But you know what? I'm grateful for the fact that they knew that in my growing years that I needed other people to play a part in my development. As I was just preparing this message this week, I began to think of a guy called Bob. See, when, when I was in my teens, I was a part of this church. I, I, I was talking to some people yesterday at, at Lynn's mum's birthday. They said, you know, we were bits of terriers around this church and they began to tell, them what, tell me what they used to do in this church. I thought, well, that was pretty mild compared to what I was doing. But this guy, Bob, took about half a dozen of us that really didn't quite fit in. We were too old for the youth, too old, sorry, for the children's ministry, a little bit young for the youth ministry. We, we just didn't fit in. But this guy, Bob, took a few of us. He taught us mechanics. We literally pulled his mower apart, put it back together. I understand the week after he put back the bits we'd left out <laughs> and it's working again. Downstairs, this church, Hope Centre, used to be called Glad Tidings Tabernacle. We met in Barry Parade, the valley. And we had a basement. Down in the basement, with Bob and these half a dozen other mates, we built a 16-foot Canadian canoe from scratch. And he showed us woodwork, and he showed us this, but he showed us more than that. He showed us how to live. Bob would never have known that 27 years after that, I'd become the senior pastor of the very church we were building that kayak in. You just don't know who you're affecting. So, so, so why don't we just do what, I love what Mother Teresa said, the problem with most of us, we've drawn the, our family circle way too small. Just make it bigger, let others in and, and walk them the journey of discipleship. You don't know what miracle you could be part of. Don't turn me off if you think you're average and boring. You know what society needs? Average and boring. Just needs some people that turn up to work every day, live well, eat well, look after their bodies, are kind to others. We just need more of that. And before you say, ah, oh, what, what have I got to offer? You know, I'm just an ordinary human being. Can I tell you something? There are people around you right now where, where average and boring seems radical and appealing. And from my experience from Bob, I, I, I've, I've written a whole chapter on Bob in my book. You get to meet him. I'm so ordinary, honestly, the most ordinary human being, even had his own struggles. God used him to affect and shape some of us, all of, many of whom ended up in ministry. The kids that didn't fit in, God used an average, ordinary guy. He can use you too. 
And parents, listen, even Christian parents, don't be so committed to be in a helicopter that you suffocate your kids and there's no one can come and contribute because you know what? You can't offer them all they need to become a responsible citizen and a dynamic follower of Jesus. Let the kids ministry and let the youth ministry and let the young adults ministry in. Let, let other, I, I get all the whole thing of being safe and wise. I get all that. But there are good people that can actually stand beside you and partner with you to raise champions so we don't have another generation that's not be, becoming all they could be to the glory of God. I even, one of my sons, um, not the one that's here. Um, both my boys became school captain. There's a dad boast. I remember one day, my son comes home and says, Dad, I've been nominated to be school captain. I said, that's awesome. And he looked at me and said, no, it's not. He looked at me, I remember him saying, he said, Dad, I'm not you. So you lead everything. I'm, that's not who I am. I said, well, I got this funny feeling you are, mate. And I still remember him. He said, okay. I said, we'll, we'll pray together. He said, okay. And then he looked at me and goes, but I will check this out with Andrew Carter. Pastor Andrew was our pastor at Logan for 10 years, still ministers all around our campuses and serving, preaching in Adelaide today. He was our youth pastor for many years. And you know what? Thank you, Dad, for your advice, but I'm going to see it. that other person that you trust, see what they say. Put his hand up and became school captain. Allow other people into your world as well. Thank God for the teams, folks, that work with our kids and our youth and they're, they're amazing. I love them. I bless them. But, but there's another generation beyond our teens that I have deep concern for. And this is where we're going to finish today in a moment. It's for those we term millennials and the older Gen Zs. Or if you watch a lot of television, Gen Z. I, I, I have deep concern for them because... Many of them are the offspring of the most divorced parents in our nation's history. And they didn't have all the reference points they need. Many of them are finding Jesus. And yet they just need somebody that'll walk with them, talk with them, love them, encourage them. The best picture I have of this kind of discipleship is... It's, it's a poor photo, but let me just to illustrate, I'm going to put it on the screen. This is my best image of discipleship. It's a tree that we stake. This tree, if we want it to grow straight, all we need to do is put something strong and straight beside it and bind it to it and give it time. It will grow up straight. You and I need to commit to being those tree stakes, standing beside people. You know, you ever hear somebody, oh, they're bent out of shape? Well, help straighten them up. Get beside them and bind them to your heart through love, through prayer, through faith, and see what they could become. So what does this look like in a local church community? Simply serving one another in love. quiet music behind me says we're almost done <laughs> the Holy Spirit gripped my heart for this this week it was like driving the first time in my Prado everywhere I see it I was in the state I saw it I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it. I'm like, okay, God, you're speaking to me, but you're speaking to us. We need mature, aged followers of Jesus that'll simply put their hand up. Put their ordinary, average hand up. Saying, God, if you've put the lonely, you've put the isolated, perhaps the broken, perhaps the, they're not completely bitter and twisted, but they, they just need a bit of help to straighten up. And I'm in. I'm going to give you four words. Here they are. 
available. Probably a cousin to available is approachable. You know what some of us need to do through this house and through our workplace? We just need to walk a little slower. We need to be a little more approachable. Get our game face off and our kind face on. You know, so many days each week are filled up with breakfast, usually with young men. I got one tomorrow. Got one Thursday. I had one last week. Had two the week before. Had groups and individuals. I want to help a generation go and grow into their destiny in God. Will you join me? We sing songs, I want to be like Jesus. Let me tell you how you like Jesus. Jesus walked a little slower. He looked around. He let people reach out and touch him. Second word, willing. Willing what? Willing to learn. Don't be a know-it-all. You ever seen that T-shirt, the older I get, the better I was? New generation can teach you a lot. I don't know how many times I hand my phone over to another generation and say, can you fix this? It's another world and we can learn from them and we can learn from each other and we can grow. Here's the next big one. It's two words. Role models. Just show people what it means to have healthy relationships. Have a steadfast faith. Pay your bills on time. Live with godly convictions. Be an employee everybody wants. Just let, let's, let's be that. And the final one, active. Active in prayer. There's only so much you can do for people. But oh, I'm going to tell you what. When you get to the level that you've tapped out, that's when the Holy Spirit gets to work. And nothing is impossible for God. Can you say amen? Nothing is impossible with the God. So I want you to stand with me today. I'm going to pray for you. Whether you're watching this online live, whether you're catching this on our website, I, I want you to hear me say I'm not talking about codependent relationships. That's not the kingdom of God. It's life-giving. See, the kingdom of God never controls. It releases. It empowers. It sets you up to go further. But perhaps some of us today, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to us. Perhaps it just starts with a younger person approaching an older man, an older woman, or vice versa, and you simply say, would you mind if I had a coffee with you? And with due respect, I can't have coffee with you all. So please, and your pastors are great. But we've got some amazing people in this church that are over 40. They're incredible. Living life, raising great families, serving in the community, serving in the house. They're extraordinary. And you know what? They got big hearts that want to let you in. You need to be a little bit brave. I used to hear a lot of time, where are all the fathers? I say, where are all the sons? Where are all the mothers? Where are the daughters? Come on, let's, let's just get rid of some of this intimidation and fear and step across the line and say, would you help me? Can we just have a chat? And maybe, maybe all you get out of it is a free coffee. Perhaps what you get is a tree steak that helps you grow into your destiny. So we're going to pray. Our service has reached our time, but I want to pray for you. Would you bow your head? Father, let it not be said of our generation. They had great meetings. They experienced your blessing, but they failed to show the kingdom to a generation that followed them. Speak to us. We know this word needs to be reminded, prodded, challenged to our hearts over and over again. We know it's just not an emotional response but a lifestyle you're calling this house to. So speak, Lord, we're listening. I wonder if you are one of these 
folks this morning that says, you know what, I, 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 I just, God, I don't even know what this means, but I, I could be Bob. I could be Mary. Use my ordinariness, Lord. Just place your hand on your heart. Say, God, I don't even know what this is going to mean. I don't even know what it's going to mean. But here am I, use me. Pray your own prayer in this. My prayer for you as you commit this to the Lord, my prayer is that you would have a heart that expands and eyes that see what God sees, ears that hear, a sensitivity of the Holy Spirit to know how to help and who to help. And I join with you in believing that we will fulfill the great commission and make disciples in this house and from this house. While those in that space are praying, I wonder if you are someone that says, boy, this is the very thing I've been looking for. Maybe you just place your hand on your heart too and say, God, that's me. There's stuff in my life. I've been carrying it since I was a child. For some reason, all the relationships fail. I, wait, I keep spiraling. I just got questions. I don't know who to ask. Just, you know what? My prayer for you is that you would find a kingdom friend. You would find a discipler. I pray that you, a Timothy, would find a Paul. I pray for that you, a Ruth, would find a Naomi. I pray that the culture of this house is one of celebration and support and intergenerational impartation. In the name of Jesus. Before we close, I want to ask a question while people are praying across this room and while you're watching here online. I wonder how many need to say, you know what, Wayne, you're talking about God as a father. I've never thought of him in that light. But I watch the joy on the faces of people being baptized today that they've discovered something. I'll tell you what they have discovered. They've discovered that they could have a relationship with the creator of the planet and the universe that is inviting us to call him Father only because of what his own son Jesus did. He died for the penalty of all of our sins to cover it. The cost is covered. He rose again. And the dynamic that you're sensing in this room right now is the work of the Holy Spirit touching hearts, your heart and drawing you. And there's an invitation that says, would you like to come into a relationship with God? Your heart's telling you this is what you're looking for. And all I want to do is right now in this moment, as you say, God, I, I just sense that I need to connect with you. I, I just want to start that relationship. If that's you in this moment right now, I want to pray for you, not embarrass you. I just want you to do one thing. Just raise your hand and say, Wayne, that's me. I want to connect with God for the first time in my life. Or first time after being away from Him. Just raise your hand straight up. I'm going to pray for you. You saw, thank you. So good. Who else? Others, just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for every hand that raised just across this room. If you've raised your hand or you wish you had, place it upon your heart. My prayer for you, my friend, is that you would discover God as a loving Father. Pray that His Father heart towards you would bring you to an understanding of His unconditional love, the power of His forgiveness. And I pray you would know what it means to walk with Him in this relationship for the rest of your life. We agree for that in the name of Jesus. And everybody said...